Hi everyone, it's Kelly here. Welcome to my channel if this is your first time. Lovely to have you and welcome back if you've been before. I love having you either way. So thank you so much for stopping by and for checking out one of my videos. Uh, this video today is a book haul. Um, I'm going to say for July, it's sort of a random assortment of books that arrived or I picked up somewhere uh, in roughly the month of July. So we'll call it the July haul. <laughs> um, but first of all, I was getting the books out of my book trolley um, to, in preparation for making this video. And I discovered that my cats <laughs> had uh, left me a little uh, present and the best kind of present, not the kind of present that cats tend to um, leave. This happens sometimes. My cats will get me gifts. Uh, so we're going to open up. I actually have no idea what is inside here. It might not even be a book. Um, it doesn't feel like a book. I'm going to be honest with you. It feels like it might be, I don't know, maybe a video game. We shall see. I don't know. It is a book. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. It is Susan Sontag's On Photography. I have read some Susan Sontag before. Uh, let me read the back to you. Susan Sontag's groundbreaking critique of photography asks forceful questions about the moral and aesthetic issues surrounding this art form. Photographs are everywhere. They have the power to shock, idealize or seduce. They create a sense of nostalgia and act as a memorial. And they can be used as evidence against us or to identify us. Here, Sontag examines the ways in which we use these omnipresent images to manufacture a sense of reality and authority in our lives. Very interesting. It does look a little bit dense, I'm not going to lie, but um, very interesting, cats. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so that's my first haul. Well, technically, we're recording this in August, but we'll include it here. Uh, Susan Sontag on photography. Right, let's talk about the books that I have uh, selected for myself. Let's flip this around so we can see it as it comes. I've got a big stack here. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is Hand Spun Rosaries by Dina Clarice. Uh, this is a poetry collection. Um, uh, there she is, Dina Clarice. Um, so I have never read anything by her before. Uh, but it says on the back here that Handspun Rosaries is the communion of a lapsed Catholic, the memories and reflections of a Filipina American immigrant raised to internalize the colonial heritage of her Christian centric society. Um, so that should be interesting as a sort of like a backdrop to the poems. Um, and it says, in these poems, Dina Clarice weaves prayer and narrative into a lifelong interrogation of God. She scavenges for the rem rem blah, blah remnants is the word I was trying to say, for the remnants of faith in identity, reminisces on family rituals, questions the dogmatic mon monsterization of women, and ultimately invites us to look for a new expanded horizon of belief and faith. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to reading this. It's a very um, short collection, so I should be able to get through this in a, you know, perhaps in an afternoon. Um, but yeah, definitely very interested and like this is such a beautiful cover too such a gorgeous image um perfect absolutely perfect can't wait to get to that one uh the next one that is one that i ordered i can't remember who i heard talking about this book but it just sounded really interesting it's hurdy gurdy by uh christopher wilson and it says it is the year of our Lord, 1349, and it is the season of the plague. Novice friar, Brother Diggory, now 16, has lived in the monastery of the Order of St. Odo at Y since his eighth birthday, but his life is about to change. The sickness is creeping ever closer and the monks must attend to the victims. When Brother Diggory is nominated to tend to those afflicted, he realises he is about to meet the plague and that it is that it is more powerful than him. What he doesn't realise is that encountering an illness and understanding it are two quite different things. Uh, so that sounds absolutely fascinating, um, and I can't wait to get to it. I also absolutely love this cover as well, um, especially this guy. <laughs> love it. Okay, so that's Hurdy Gurdy. Uh, the next book I've got on my stack is The Bus on Thursday by Shirley Barrett. Now, I read 
um, Shirley Barrett's book called Rush O um, earlier this year and I absolutely loved it. I did not know she had a second book. This was um, released some time ago, but I managed to find myself a copy. Um, uh, when did this come out? I feel like it was some time ago, 2018, so not that long ago. Um, but yeah, I wasn't aware of it um, as much as I was aware of Rush O. Uh, so this is a sort of a mystery type of story. Um, it has mixed reviews, but I, given how much I enjoyed Rush O, I'm willing to give it a chance. So it says, Eleanor arrives in Talbingo, population 241, looking for a fresh start. But 241 has recently become 240 because the town's school teacher has gone AWOL, presenting Eleanor with a chance to start again. Escaping a life turned upside down, recovering from a bad breakup and illness, Eleanor thinks Talbingo might offer a regenerative sort of as a form of solitude. What she actually finds is a remote cabin with no phone service or Wi-Fi, but an alarming number of locks on the front door, which someone keeps knocking on late at night. Riotously funny, deeply unsettling and surprisingly poignant, Shirley Barrett's The Bus on Thursday is a dis disconcerting story of small town life and a wicked, weird, wild ride. It also has a gorgeous colour. Bit of a theme, bit of a theme going on here with gorgeous covers. Okay, the next one is one that I picked up when I was book shopping um, at one of my favorite bookshore, bookshores, bookstores is what I was trying to say. I tried to say shop and store at the same time. That's why I, I, it's, it's late in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, this is Rag and Bone, A History of What We've Thrown Away by Lisa Woollett. Um, so this is a non-fiction book, which I do read non-fiction, obviously, but I tend to mostly gravitate towards fiction. So um, it's a bit unusual to get non-fiction on my channel. Uh, okay, so this uh, says, Lisa Woollett has spent her life co uh, combing beaches and mudlarking, collecting curious fragments of the past from Roman tiles and Tudor thimbles to Victorian buttons and plastic soldiers. In a series of walks from the Thames out to the Kentish estuary and eventually to Cornwall, she traces the history of our rubbish and through it reveals the surprising story of our changing consumer culture. Timely and beautifully written, Rag and Bone shows what we can learn from what we've thrown away and urges us to think more about what we leave behind. Um, inside this book, and I think this is partly what kind of got me to pick it up and actually take it home there are these gorgeous photographs of different collections of things that she's found um, that just look so fascinating um, so yeah I'm looking forward to getting to this one I probably won't get to it soon 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 um, but I really really am keen to read it because it just sounds really fascinating the next one that I've got is called Amari and the Knight Brothers uh, by B.B. Alston, Alston. Um, and it says, and Mari Peters knows three things. Her brother, Quinton, has gone missing. No one will talk about it. His mysterious job holds a clue. So when she's invited for a trial at the Bureau of Supernatural Affairs, Amari is certain that this is her chance to save him. But first she has to get her head around the new world of the Bureau, where mermaids, aliens and magicians are real and her roommate is a were-dragon. Amari must compete for a spot against kids who've known about this world their whole lives and with a civil, sorry, that says evil, not civil, with an evil magician threatening the entire supernatural world, Amari has never felt more alone. But if she doesn't pass the three tryouts, she may never find out what happened to Quinton. Um, so this is, I would say, probably a middle grade book um, and I'm very excited to read it. It sounds like it has a lot of potential to be... Um, you know, sort of a really interesting world to delve into. And this character um, sounds fascinating also. So I'm keen to kind of get to know her and find out about her world. So yeah, should be good. Uh, the next book on my uh, stack is one that I bought a little impulsively. I've never heard this recommended by anybody, um, but it came up in my... Uh, kindle recommendations um no not this one the sequel came up in my kindle recommendations and i 
it looked interesting. So I was like, well, I don't want to start with the second book in the series. I'll start with the first one. Um, so it's called Apothecary Melchior and the Mystery of St. Olaf's Church by Indrek Hagler. Um, I don't know anything about uh, this, but it is a, it's set in Estonia other than that it's set in Estonia because I did read about it when I was buying it. I didn't just buy it because of the cover or anything like that, which I do. I do that all the time. <laughs> but this one, I read, I looked into it, um, but I don't really know anything about, um, about this world so much. Um, so it says, from medieval Estonia, a new hero in detective fiction. The acclaimed Apothecary Melchior series plunges the reader into 15th century Tallinn, a first a fast growing. I am struggling to read today, as you can tell. A fast growing Hanseatic town. I don't know what that means, but Hanseatic has a capital H. Uh, so possibly a group of people or an era. I don't know. Uh, anyway, at the furthest reaches of the Christian world, dominated by the mighty tomb. Tomb Pier Castle, stronghold of the Teutonic Order, and St. Olaf's Church, the tallest building in the world. Melchior Wakensteed, the, the town's apothecary, is respected for his arcane scientific knowledge and his wisdom. When a Teutonic knight is gruesomely murdered, Melchior is called to help find the killer, revealing a, a remarkable talent for detection. But it seems Tallinn has a serial killer in its midst, and he is tested to the limit in a plot with as many twists and turns as the turreted castle. He uncovers a mystery surrounding St. Olaf's and an influential secret society that has been controlling the town for years, revelations that spell danger for all. So, sounds like a really interesting world um, that, that we'll be delving into. Uh, so I'm keen to get to this um, and to see what I think about this series, uh, because then if I enjoy this one, I will get the next one. Uh, the next book I got uh, because it was recommend recommended by uh, Emma at the yes at by Emma at the channel Emmy, which I will leave a link to below. Um, I knew about this poet, um, but I have I didn't know about this particular collection, um, and I have read some of her work before, but I was very interested to get to this one. Um, so it, and I bought myself a copy. So it's My People by Ujuru. Um, so this is, as you can see up in the top corner, it came out roughly 50 years ago. Um, but she, this is a, an Australian Aboriginal poet, um, once known as Kath Walker, but um, going by her name, Ujuru. Um, and this is supposed to be a really, really good collection of her poetry. Um, so Emma on the Emmy channel read this book and really enjoyed it. So I thought I'll get myself a copy and um, I look forward to getting to this collection as well. It's not too thick. So again, I should be able to get through it um, pretty quickly, but I, I'm really keen to get to, get some more poetry happening in my life at the moment. The next one that I've got is a book that I found um, secondhand, and I was really, really happy to find it. It's uh, The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot uh, by Marianne Cronin. Um, this is a book about two uh, women. One of them is, or one's a teenager, um, who is 17, I believe. Um, so her name is Lenny, um, and she is living in the terminal ward. Um, and she meets, she joins an art class where she meets, uh, a woman called Margot, who is a rebel hearted 83 year old from the next ward. Um, and they have an instant bond and they decide that they're going to paint the story of their lives. Um, so that's why it's the 100 years cause combined, there they equal 117 plus 83 is eight is 100 um and it's sort of about them painting the the years of their lives and kind of reflecting back on their lives um so far uh so yeah it's a sort of about a an unusual friendship i guess and um forged in unusual circumstances and i'm looking forward to reading it when i can get to it uh, the last book in my stack is a sequel. Um, I read the first book in this, um, I guess we can call it a series now because there's two. I don't know if there are more coming. 
Um, so the book, the, the first book was called The Miniaturist by Jesse Burton. And this is the sequel to it, um, the, the House of Fortune. I pre-ordered this book when I heard that it was coming out. Um, so I don't know if this is the end of the story or if there's more to come, but um, The Miniaturist is an interesting book. Uh, so it's set in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam. Amsterdam's in the Netherlands, right? I hope so. I hope I don't sound like an idiot. <laughs> um, so this book is set in Amsterdam in 1705. Um, and... The previous book, The Miniaturist, was also set there um, and it followed a character who, um, it's hard to explain the plot. Basically, she keeps getting these little miniatures um, of furniture. She, she gets this, what I would describe as like a doll's house for adults um, and it's like a miniature version of the house she lives in, including like miniature reproductions of furniture and so on. And then she keeps getting these like miniature figures and things as well um, that are, that kind of start to reveal aspects of the people that she's living with and it sort of becomes a bit creepy. Um, but I, at the time when I read it, I thought to myself, I, I had enjoyed the book. Um, the person I was buddy reading it with didn't enjoy it as much as I did. Um, and I don't know whether I just let her opinion of the book color mine um but i ended up getting rid of my copy that i had bought so that we could do the buddy read um and then i just it's a book that sat rent free in my head for a really long time and eventually i ended up finding a second hand copy of it um so i now have uh a, another copy of the miniaturist um which i will probably reread again before I get to this one. Uh, but let's find out what this story is about. Uh, so our character is called Thea Brandt and she is turning 18 and is ready to welcome adulthood with open arms. At the city's theatre, Walter, the love of her life, awaits her. But at home in the house on the Herrengracht, all is not well. Her father, Otto, and Aunt Nella argue endlessly. And the Brandt family are selling their furniture in order to eat. On Thea's birthday, also the day that her mother... Marin died, the secrets from the past begin to overwhelm the present. Okay, so this, I believe, it's been a while since I've read The Miniaturist, but those names sound familiar, so I feel like those are the characters from The, Miniatur the Miniaturist. Um, Nella is desperate to save the family and maintain appearances to find Thea, a husband, who will guarantee her future. And when they receive an invitation to Amsterdam's most exclusive ball, she is overjoyed. Perhaps this will set their fortunes straight. And indeed, the ball does set things spinning. And new, new figures enter their life, promising new futures. But their fates are still unclear. And when Nella feels a strange prickling sensation on the back of her neck, she remembers the miniaturist who entered her life and toyed with her fortunes 18 years ago. Perhaps now she has returned for her. Um, so that sounds really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, I will probably reread The Miniaturist before I read this one, just to kind of re-familiarise myself with the story, because it was probably, I don't know, about 10 years ago or so, maybe even longer than that, that I read. Wait, how long ago did that book come out? I don't know. This one's only just come out, but I don't know when The Miniaturist would have come out. Anyway, I'm interested to get back to it um, and to reread and find out... Um, how the story kind of continues because as I said it's a book that ended up like it you know how when you put the book down sometimes and you have an opinion of it at the time but then just sort of it it continues to sit with you it doesn't happen all the time but just occasionally that will happen with a book um and it your opinion of it kind of starts to change over time like you the way that you're thinking about it so yeah I just remember being really fascinated by um by the story originally and yeah so I definitely want to read the um the sequel as well uh so that is my haul for the month of july plus a surprise from the cats which i can't even see at the bottom um so yeah i collect books and i also read them as two separate hobbies uh so thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this video and i look forward to chatting with you on the next one